Hey there, Touch Designer developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to work on creating a piece of generative art in the style of Rafik Anadol. Rafik's recent immersive installations have used either particle systems or some sort of physics simulation, uh, and we're going to use them as the inspiration for the aesthetic of the piece that we're generating today. Now we're going to keep this example beginner friendly in that we're going to work exclusively with the built-in operators uh, that Touch Designer offers. This will be a great example if you are new to particle systems as we're going to cover everything from setting up the basics of your particle system, adding some more advanced techniques and components to build this turbulent sort of effect that we have on screen, as well as working with post effects to refine the output, adding things like a pseudo depth of field effect, as well as some additional refinements. In part one of this video, we're going to focus mainly on setting up our particle system. So we're going to dive into our initial render pipeline, the uh, particle SOP and uh, how to generate a particle system with that, some of the parameters, and then we'll finish up with surface attractors, which will allow us to apply an attraction force to the particles, which we will eventually see in our final output. Let's begin by adding a box op to the network. So I'm using a box op here because a lot of Rafik's uh, recent pieces seem to use some kind of simple geometry, whether that's a cube or some like elongated uh, rectangular geometry. Um, but feel free to connect whatever type of geometry you want to this network to experiment with different compositions. So uh, before we move on from the box, we need to adjust the size parameter here. So for the size Z parameter all the way on the right here, I need to set that to five to create, if we take a look at the viewer for a second, an elongated box shape like this. Then I want to uh, uniformly reduce the scale of this box across all dimensions. So I'm going to take the scale parameter and set that to 0.1 which as you can see has shrunk that down quite a bit. We're going to follow that up with a geometry comp. So let's head back to the comp page, grab the geometry comp and we'll place that to the right. So we're going to continue right along with our rendering setup. In this case, we're going to need a camera as usual, but we're also going to use a light because I want to have some shading based on that light. So. The camera, um, we're just going to modify the position of just ever so slightly. We're going to shift that forward in the Z direction to a value of four and hit enter. And then we can move along to the light. So for the light, I wanted to project the light above the uh, particle system that we're going to be generating and have that kind of project from above uh, onto those boxes to give a little bit of dimensionality. So um, I'm going to adjust the position of that operator and uh, we'll go ahead and start with our translate parameters first and then continue down to rotate and pivot. So for uh, translation in the X direction, we're going to leave that at zero. For the Y direction, I'm gonna set that to negative 1.85 and then I'll tab over to the Z direction and set that to 4.85. So as you can see, we've kind of shifted the camera a little bit away from that center axis. Then I'm going to set a rotation value in the X axis to negative 30, which again has further uh, shifted the camera away from that center point. But then if we go ahead and modify these pivot parameters below, we should sort of reposition that a little bit in space and um, get that uh, overhead lighting that I was talking about. So I'm going to start with a pivot value of 0 0.25 for X, 1 for the uh, Y, and then for Z, we'll do negative 10. There we go. So the uh, center point is now visible once again. Now the other thing we need before we actually render this to a top texture is a uh, material. And because I want this to utilize the lighting and have some shading to it, I'm going to use the Fong Mat. 
So I'm going to grab the Fong mat, place that to the right. We don't need to make any changes to this operator. Uh, we're just going to leave it as is. So I'm going to then click and drag it onto the GeoComp, and then I'll hit Parameter Material to make that connection. Now I'm going to um, add the render top so we can actually render this to a texture. And there we go, we have one tiny little box in the center of the screen. So that is kind of our uh, initial precursor setup. Um, the other thing I might do here is to add a null over here, which I'll call uh, null space out or null space final, whatever you want. Um, just to kind of preemptively get that set up. And then we can continue on to instancing and really to the particle system, which is going to generate this effect. So let's begin by adding a sphere SOP. For the particle SOP, we need to specify a piece of geometry from which we're going to generate our particles. So what's going to happen is for each one of the points that make up the sphere, we're going to generate a particle, and then uh, the normal of that point uh, will specify the kind of initial velocity and the direction of movement that that particle will take on. So um, the first thing that we're going to do with our sphere is to set the primitive type mode here to polygon. And then I want to also increase the uh, amount of detail within this shape. So I've opened up the viewer uh, via, via hitting the A button on the keyboard. You can also hit the button in the lower right. If I hit W for wireframe, we can see this is a pretty low poly sphere at the moment. So um, I'm going to increase the amount of detail and the amount of points within that shape by adjusting this frequency slider. I'm gonna set that to a value of 12 which then has greatly increased the amount of detail to that shape. So that's looking good. Um, I'm going to continue on by adding a transform SOP. We're going to use the transform SOP to increase the scale of the sphere. So in the end, what I want is a uh, sphere that is larger than the space that's being shown by our camera so that we can generate uh, particles off screen and then have them move towards the center of the screen. So with the transform SOP, I'm just going to simply use this uniform scale parameter to set um, our scale uniformly larger to a value of 5. From there, I'm going to attach a delete SOP, which I'm going to use to actually cut a hole in our sphere. So what's going to happen in the end is that we're going to be generating uh, particles from each one of the points that make up this sphere. And what that means is there will be uh, several points that are located directly behind the camera, which means that we will have a bunch of boxes flying from behind our camera, through the camera, and towards the center, uh, which will give us a kind of weird situation sometimes where we'll see our entire screen filled up with a box. So by deleting a section of this sphere, we're going to avoid that uh, situation and uh, uh, it won't be noticeable at all to our final effect. So I'm going to um, start off within this delete SOP by changing the entity here to points. What that is telling us is that we're going to be deleting points from this piece of geometry. And then I'm going to head to the bounding volume page and turn the use bound switch on. So if we move within the sphere, we can see that we are actually, uh, we do actually have a bounding box, but it's very small and located in the uh, center of the shape inside of it. And so it's not actually deleting anything from the surface of the shape. So if I increase, first of all, the size here to a value of four, and then I shift the center position uh, to a value of five in the Z direction, we can then cut a square-ish section out of our shape. Now again, since this is going to be generating particles and we will never see this piece of geometry, the kind of jagged edges that this is generating are not a problem. So cool, we've got that piece cut out of our geometry. Um, one other thing that we are going to do here is to shift the direction of the normals that make up this shape. So 
Um, I'm going to use my viewer active here once again and right click in the background and hit display options. And then I'm going to turn on this uh, point normals option. What we can see is that we have a bunch of little lines that come outwards from each one of the points that make up this sphere. And again, as I mentioned a moment ago, that is defining the direction that our uh, and the initial velocity that our particles will have. So what that means is with the current shape that we have, the particles will be generated at the surface of the shape and then move outwards from that shape. We want the reverse to happen where the particles will generate from the surface of the shape and then move inwards towards the center of the screen. So what can we do to uh, create that situation? We can use the point SOP to modify the normals of this shape. So if we come to this option here that says keep normal, we can hit add normal here. And then uh, we have, if we click on the parameter title, we have a bunch of expressions already entered in for us. These are pulling the normals in from the, uh, the geometry connected to the input. So we want to keep those expressions as they are. However, if we want to invert them, we can then multiply each one of these expressions by a particular value. So what I want to do in this case is to not just invert them, but also reduce the, uh, the kind of amount that this vector uh, contains. So I'm going to, instead of multiplying by negative one, I'm going to multiply by negative 0 0.5, uh, which again, that's going to invert and reduce the scale of that vector. So what I'm gonna do then is copy and paste that expression or component of the expression into each one of these parameters uh, until we have what we see here where each one is multiplied by negative 0.5. Now what you should have noticed is that the shading of the shape has changed and if I right click in the background and hit display options and turn on normals again we can see that the normals are only found on the inside of the shape and because I've reduced the amount of each one of those vectors, they look a little bit closer to points, but uh, never fear, they are still uh, vectors and not points. So great, that has accomplished that for us. And then the next thing that I wanna do, the final thing that we're going to do before we um, actually connect this to a particle stop and start to generate particles, is to change the sorting of these points. So, in the current setup that we have, if we right click on the background, again, uh, I've hit the viewer active switch. First of all, I should point out, hit display options, and then we click on the option directly to the left of normals, which is point numbers. We have a lot of numbers here. Um, but one thing that we can start to see, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult to see because there's so many numbers here, but, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that each one of the points that are contained within the sphere have a number associated with them and they are composed in this current setup in a very specific order. What that means, and the best way to see this is probably to visualize it with a particle SOP, is that our particles will be generated in a very specific fashion. So let's, let's go ahead and connect this to the particle SOP now so that you can see what it is that I'm talking about. So I'm going to right click and add a particle SOP to the right. And it doesn't look like a whole lot's happening at the moment. That's okay. Um, we're going to hit viewer active uh, here and right click on the background, turn off adaptive homing first of all. Then I'm going to open display options once again and turn on this points switch here in the upper right, which will make it much easier to see the particles that are being generated. So you can see here that it is generating particles in a very specific ordering, which is definitely not random. Um, and in our case, I think that our final aesthetic looks better when these particles are being generated at random points around the sphere. So our sort SOP that we connected uh, will actually allow us to change the ordering of those points. So all we have to do within the sort SOP is to change this point sort parameter to random, and we're now generating particles at random points around that sphere. 
So that is uh, actually it for the kind of setup of our um, particle source. And we can now move on to adjusting our particle SOP to um, make our particle system function in the way that we want. Now, before we uh, start to fine tune this particle SOP, actually another helpful thing for us to do here is to attach a null to the end and use this information for our instances. This is, uh, you know, in our final iteration, what is going to be um, generating our instances anyway. So by connecting this now, we can get a good idea of what is actually happening as we're making these parameter changes. So um, I've added that null. I'm going to rename this to INSTPOS for instance positions. Then let's come within our geo um, where we're going to head to the instance page. Yours should be set to uh, instancing off by default. We're going to turn that switch on. And then I'm going to drag the null instance position operator onto the translate op parameter. We're then going to pull in the point positions for our translate X, Y, and Z, which are the P012 uh, channels that we have at the top. So go ahead and click on that right arrow, grab P0 for translate X, P1 for translate Y, and finally P2 for translate Z. We should then see on our screen here that we have uh, some boxes that are moving just a little bit around the screen and then sort of disappearing as those particles die off. The other thing that we want to do while we're here is to um, enable a, uh, a rotation value for each one of these instances to be grabbed again from the same operator. So we can, from this operator, we can grab the kind of direction of movement as a vector and then orient those um, boxes based on that vector. So again, uh, we're going to head to another page of our geocomp and add in a reference to this operator. So head to the instance two page, grab null instance position, drag that into the rotate two operator parameter. And then for the rotate to vector X, we want V zero, the fourth option, rotate to vector Y, we want V one, and then rotate to vector Z, we want V two. You can see this more within the geo, but now the instances are pointing in the direction that they're moving um, instead of all being in a sort of static orientation. That'll become more useful as we uh, continue working with our particle system. So we've got this set up and ready for us to continue fine tuning the particle system and again, be able to see exactly what we're doing to our final output. So let's jump back to the particle SOP. We've got a couple of things to modify here. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is to head to the particles page where we're going to modify the birth and the life expectancy parameters. So the birth parameter, um, if we alt and mouse over, uh, is the number of particles born each second. So what that means is we can increase the amount of particles that we're uh, creating each second by increasing this parameter. So if I hit uh, enter in a value of 300 here, we can see that we're generating immediately a lot more particles and thus in our output we have a lot more boxes being created. Um, that's looking pretty good. Uh, the other thing that we can do here is to modify the life expectancy, which again, if we mouse over, with the Alt key held down is how long each particle will exist in seconds. So right now they only exist for a total of three seconds, which is why uh, these particles are, or these boxes are so rapidly disappearing from our render. If we increase this life expectancy to something like 25, um, we will see after a bit that our particles and our boxes will last much longer on screen. Now, they don't have much force applied to them yet, so it will kind of build up and appear as though these are sort of sitting in a static position. That's okay. Um, we're going to continue fine tuning this, as I mentioned, um, but that will enable us to generate a lot more particles on screen. 
If we middle mouse click on our particle stop, we can see that we have a total of 7,502 points at the, uh, at the present. And that is um, a lot. And uh, we're going to do a couple of things to kind of control that amount. Um, if you ever run into any performance issues because of the number of particles that we're generating in this current setup, all you have to do is modify either the amount of particles that we're generating via the birth parameter or how long those particles are lasting for via the life expectancy parameter. So uh, from there, we're going to set this surface attraction value to two, which is not going to do anything at the moment, um, but will come into effect later on. Then I'm going to come to the forces page where I'm going to add some turbulence to these particles. So if we again, alt middle mouse over or alt mouse over the uh, turbulence parameter, this is going to apply uh, turbulent forces to each axis and give a little bit more organic randomness to the movement of these, these particles. This is where it's going to start looking more like Rafik Anadol's work. Um, so I'm going to increase the value here to two. And you can see immediately the particles start moving in a more organic and random fashion. Um, we can really see this if we take a look at the output here in our render, the particles are kind of meandering, or the boxes rather are meandering around screen a lot more, moving in different directions, and um, you know, giving us something that immediately looks much closer to our final result. Now, um, one thing, now that we've added the this kind of randomness to the movement, one thing that is helpful is to set up some limit boundaries so that if these particles ever move too far out of the bounds of at least our camera, they will be deleted so that they won't waste processing power. So we can do that within the particle stop by heading to this limits page. I'm going to set my limit plane here in the positive direction to values of five for each one of the X, Y, Z parameters there. And then for the negative limit plane, I'm going to set each value to negative five. Again, that's going to give us uh, the ability when particles pass those boundaries to automatically um, have them die on contact and then regenerate uh, so that we're not wasting processing power. So now that we've made all these changes, um, it's often good practice to reset the particle system because we might end up uh, with uh, certain particles that are kind of stuck or not moving any longer and are not regenerated properly as they should be. So I'll often reset the particle system as I'm working on it just to make sure that I don't uh, end up with that situation. You can see here now that as these particles move outside of those boundaries we just set up, they are being deleted. Um, although, again, from the camera view, you wouldn't necessarily notice this as much because we're cropped in on a section of uh, that composition. So uh, we're going to now continue on by adding in a surface attractor, which is going to kind of pull these particles around screen. So I'm going to use another sphere sop for this. This will be a, a little uh, ball that, again, we won't actually see, but it's going to apply a force, an attraction force to our particles as it moves around in space, which will um, give us something that looks like Rafik's kind of effects and, um, again, allow us to work with the operators that are built into touch. So for this operator, I'm not going to modify anything. I'm just going to leave it at its default settings. I'm then going to attach a transform SOP to the right. I'm going to use this to, first of all, scale down this sphere to a value of 0.5. And then I'm going to set up a number of chop channels to automatically uh, move the position of the sphere based on um, some noise that I generate in chop form. Uh, before we do that, however, I want to go ahead and connect this to the fourth input here, which is the surface attractor input. 
And what we should see in the output is that our uh, particles now are really attracted towards that center point much more, which is due to the fact that they're being attracted to this sphere shape. So if we look in the output, we can see here that we're getting something that looks a little bit crazy because the, uh, the shape is never moving in space and the particles are living long enough such that they're all kind of uh, conglomerating to this this center section. So we're going to deal with that. Don't worry about it. Um, but I just wanted to point that out as we're moving along here. So um, we're going to go ahead and add those chops in. Now I'm going to add in the noise chop, first of all, and then uh, we're going to make a couple of changes here. So um, I went ahead and set this to Hermite noise, which is a little bit less processor intensive, although it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, and then I uh, went ahead and set the period here to 10. So we've got a kind of slower rate of change in our output noise. Then I'm going to come to the common page and turn time slicing on. We don't need a kind of multi-sample chop for this. We just need a, a real-time single value um, output, so time slicing will work just great for that. And then on the channel page, I'm going to set up three different channels here. So this is going to be uh, translating rather in the X, Y, and Z directions. So I'm going to set this to T, X, T, Y, and T, Z uh, with spaces in between so that I can generate three channels for us. Then I'm going to use select chops to split this out into separate channels so we can modify the range of these uh, chop channels independently. So for the first one here, I'm going to, um, I want to select TX and TY specifically. So I'm going to, in the channel names parameter, use some pattern matching I'm going to use the little caret uh, by hitting shift and six on the American keyboard. And then I'll type in uh, TZ, which means we're not selecting TZ, but we're selecting everything else. So we've got then TX and TZ there. And then I'm going to copy and paste that. And in this second one, I want the TZ channel uh, only by itself. So I'm going to remove that caret and um, there we go, we've got just the TZ channel by itself. So for each one of these, I'm then going to attach a math chop. We're going to use math chops uh, for both to, again, adjust the output range that we're generating for those operators, or for those channels, rather. So within the first one here, I'm going to um, head to the range page. I'm going to set the from range uh, in the kind of ideal, ideal situation, our noise will generate values between negative one and positive one, although it'll probably be rare that we ever reach each one of those minimum or maximum values. And then I'm going to set the two range, which will be our output to negative three and positive three. So that will directly affect the uh, range of motion that this sphere is going to eventually move in. For Z, um, I'm going to modify the range in a little bit different of uh, a way than I've done for the TX and TY. And this, uh, like the sphere that we set up for our particles, has to do with our camera. So I don't ever want this, this sphere that is kind of pulling the particles towards it to overlap with the camera in space. So I'm going to modify the range accordingly. So again, I'm going to set the from range here to from negative one to positive one. And then in the two range, I'm actually going to bump the minimum here to negative five and the maximum to a value of two. So we've got all that set up. We can then combine these channels back together using a merge chop. And then finally attach a null to the end here, which we will call null transform because it's going to transform our attractor. From there, uh, we can click viewer active and make some chop references to the translate X, Y, and Z parameters of our uh, transform SOP. 
And then what we should see is that in the output, the particles, instead of being attracted to simply that center position of our axes, are now being pulled towards that moving shape in space. Now, uh, with all of our boxes being the same color, it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, between them and things kind of look like a blob or a mass. But uh, rest assured that when we add color, you will see a lot more uh, of dynamic movement happening in our output. One other thing that I wanted to point out is that if you ever want to take a look at the positioning of our surface attractor in comparison to the points, you can always head back to the particle SOP and click on the compare button here. And then if you were to kind of zoom in in this viewer here, we can see that our sphere is moving around and that the particles are then following suit as well. So that is it for part one of this video. Uh, stay tuned for part two, where we're going to dive in to some additional attributes that we can pull from our uh, particles to apply things like uh, scaling of our instances, as well as uh, some different color effects and opacity. And then we'll also dive into uh, further refining the output with some post effects. So hope you've enjoyed putting this together so far. Thanks so much for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.